Hello, welcome to our Friday virtual bridge session. And today I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Alice from all the way up in Inverness. Uh, and I can't see a window, so I don't know what the weather's like today up in Inverness. How's it for you, Alice? Um, it's raining and I think we're welcoming some gale force winds later this afternoon of 40 to 50 miles an hour. But I'm looking out, I look out my window just now and it, it is raining. So it's not anything like it was last weekend when we were outside with my um, beach umbrella, uh, trying to be able to uh, work at the same time as trying to enjoy some warmth and sun. So very different here. Fabulous. Beach umbrella. Inverness. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture it now. <laughs> but okay, so today's topic is becoming more human online. And that's something I'm sure that everyone wants to learn to do, especially me. So without further ado, Alice, over to you. That's lovely, Kenji. Thank you so much. I actually live in Strathpeffer, which is 20 miles north of Inverness. And um, it's a lovely Victorian spa village. So I'm going to just um, share my screen with you here. So just bear with me for a minute. Um, and it's lovely to see so many faces. I don't think that I'm going to be able to see all of you when I revert to the screen. Okay, so I'm hoping that what you can see now, so all I'm seeing just now is I can see Kenji, Owen, and Mar uh, I'm going to spend the mispronounce your name, Marianthi. Is it Ma Marianthi? Okay, so I know that there's a lot more out there um, viewing this. So I'm really delighted to have been given the opportunity to just share some of my um, experiences with you. Um, some of these will be conceptual experiences, but I hope um, towards the end that I will um, begin to share with you some practical applications around becoming more human online and what this nature of authenticity looks like um, online. Just a little bit about myself. Uh, so I've been involved in education for um, over 30 years now, and that kind of gives away my age, actually. Um, and I've been based here at Inverness College for the past 15 years. And prior to that, I was in the Central Belt Colleges. Um, at the moment, I'm a program leader for the BA Childhood Practice, the Graduate Apprentice Early Learning and Child Care, and also the HNC Childhood Practice. And two of those programs are delivered fully online. UHI, just to give you a little bit of context, is, um, uh, is in some ways an umbrella organization under which a number of institutes are based. Predominantly, those are further education institutes. Um, and therefore, my role as program leader is that, um, I use this word loosely, manage um, staff within nine academic partners um, and probably up to around about 700 students um, in the three programs that I um, work in. So UHI is really uh, geographically dispersed in terms of the, its uh, position um, and also in terms of its student cohort and, and demographics. And therefore, um, this idea of learning community uh, becomes redefined in a way in UHI because we're no longer um, constrained by learning community having to be in the same physical proximity as each, of, as each other. And therefore we're really breaking down the geographical barriers in the way that we're approaching learning and teaching within UHI. What I hope that I'm going to do today is stimulate thought um, and also what I refer to as promote reflexivity. So often we use the term reflective practitioner or reflective professional, but I would prefer to start thinking of this in terms of reflexivity because reflexivity means that as well as looking out and looking at our practice, we're also looking within and we're starting to reflect, um, a reflexive, on who we are and how who we are as individuals has an impact on our role as an online educator. You may not agree with everything that I'm going to share with you today, and that's absolutely fine. Sometimes I like being that devil's advocate and actually getting you to think and ponder and maybe raise more questions than there are necessarily answers. And again, that's what about ref being reflexive is. 
And to give you an overall idea, what I'm hoping that you'll get from the presentation today is that I'm helping you to shift the discourse away from technology, away from the flicks and tricks that technology offers, and actually start to look at the online space as a space for learning and teaching, and that the technology is not our master, but rather offers the tools and the platform in which learning and teaching takes place. And that sometimes what is required in terms of becoming more human, and this idea of authenticity online, is a change of mindset rather than uh, an entirely new set of skills. So I hope that that starts to come across in my presentation, that I'm trying to shift the lens and the discourse, the dialogue, the discussion away from the technology. And we're looking more at a pedagogical approach and how focusing on the pedagogical approach online just offers an alternative perspective. So what I'd like to start with first, and this is, I, this is really conceptually getting you to think about, <clears throat> is I've created this concept, what I, refer, what I refer to as positionality. Now, positionality will be something that you can read in the literature. It's not me that's totally created this phrase or this concept. But I think positionality really helps us when we're starting to consider the design of the online space. Our positionality is where we, as educators, position ourselves in relation to our expectations and our aim and objectives about what education means. What is it that we're trying to do and where do we position ourselves in relation to that? And it influences how we therefore engage with and use the online space, this idea of positionality. Our positionality is influenced by our biography, our life, our education that we've had, our lived experiences. So this is an internal factors that affect our positionality. But it's also affected by the subject area that you're teaching, our institutional expectations, our learners, our quality assurance um, expectations, um, the expectations that we have for ourselves. And that this can create tensions within us in terms of what we value and where we position ourselves as online educators and what externally is expected of us in terms of meeting KPIs, meeting expectations in terms of students passing. And this causes tension, tension within us. But by reflecting on our positionality and where you place yourself as an online educator offers a framework for us, which we then take with us into the online space. And it, it shows or sheds light on how we use that space in relation to where we position ourselves. So just to take this concept of positionality a little bit further. So I'm being kind of very um, either end of the spectrum here in terms of positionality. When we start looking at education, whether it's online or face to face, I'm proposing that we can at either end of the spectrum in terms of our positionality, view education as an art form or as a science. Now, you may not agree with this. And what I'm suggesting is that if you, where you position yourself in this continuum will determine in some ways how you therefore then engage with the online space. So in terms of our art positionality, this is where your position in terms of your role as an educator is that you're driven by viewing education as a, an emancipatory, transformative experience for your learners. And therefore, the knowledge and the content that you're presenting within the online space is not necessarily your most driving factor. It's what's going on in that space in terms of the interactions, and that yes, the knowledge that you're transmitting is important, but it's not your priority. 
On the other end of the spectrum, your positionality there in terms of it being viewed as a science. And therefore, you would be more um, upholding of a transmission model of education. And that means that you're viewing your learners as empty vessels. If you fall into that positionality, then your use of the online space will be as um, transmitting knowledge. It will be a dumping ground for information. And, the, and you're not focusing necessarily on this online space in terms of a humanity, interaction, relationships. It's just my learners are empty vessels and my role as an educationalist is to fill them. Whereas the art would be you're lighting fires your, your learners come to you with already lived experiences um, and your role as an educator is to draw those lived experiences out and engage with your learners as a fellow human being. And we're doing that in the online space. So the online space no longer becomes a dumping ground of knowledge. And this quote that I've shared with you is just something that really resonates with me. And there's this idea that as an educationalist, I speak more to my learners with my soul. Dirks, John Dirks speaks very much about the soulfulness of education and that we need to return the soul to education. And I'm looking at how we can do that online. That's the dialogue and the discourses that I'm engaged in. And the quotes that I've shared from you there are actually from staff. This was from a piece of research that I did with um, some staff members within my um, institute. So I just need to be really wary of my time, Kenji. Or I just will, right, okay, I'm 20 minutes. I, it, I didn't start at 11, did I? So we do, it's all right. <laughs> okay, so I'm now following forward in this idea of positionality and we're now turning our mind and our gaze to the online space here. So I'm, I, what I'm drawing out here is you'll see that what I've called here, this concept of the iceberg effect. Now that's a concept that we are very familiar with. This idea that what's under the surface is perhaps more meaningful and more significant than what we view above. <clears throat> so when we're starting to think about how we're designing the online sp space or the online curriculum, if you come at this from a position of science um, and transmission model, the knowledge is your, is your priority because your role is to transmit that knowledge. But that to me is not the most significant aspect in learning and teaching. So I use this iceberg effect to try to um, present an idea that the foundation of learning online is around affect which is your emotional and social um, dimensions and dialogue, which is your interacting with your learners, them interacting with each other, them interacting with the resources. And therefore, when you're considering the designing of your online spaces, yes, the knowledge and the content is important, but what you're doing in terms of wrapping around that content is often um, seen to be more significant. These three features have been taken from one of my colleagues' doctoral pieces of research that she finished a couple of years ago, and uh, Helen Coker. She's now moved on to Queen Margaret's in Edinburgh, but she was working with me in Inverness College at the time. And she was just a wee bit behind me in terms of her doctoral research. And she, as part of her doctoral research, came to the conclusion that overall, these are the three main characteristics that um, influence the design of online curriculum and online space. What she didn't do, which is what I've done here, is um, uh, kind of criteria them in any way. You know, she wasn't placing them in any sort of um, position of authority or privileged above, above the other. But what I did, um, some of you might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I, 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 I I thought of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that kind of triangular, you know, triangle diagrams are often used. Um, and I used that triangle diagram and I played around with, with Helen's three characteristics and I sort of positioned them. Now you can invert the diagram, 
But I then came upon this idea of the iceberg effect, because for me, the effect and the dialogue are far more significant than the, the knowledge that you're transmitting in the space. But <clears throat> this is all again around your positionality. So when you look at this diagram or you look at these three features, where you position yourself in relation to your role as an online educator will determine how you therefore um, consider these three characteristics. I forgot to say at the beginning, I am more than happy for anybody to jump in or add a comment, or we can, you know, speak more about it at the end. <clears throat> so what I'd like to move on to here, <clears throat> having got you to consider this idea of positionality, this idea of um, um, this iceberg effect, is I want to share with you some of my own um, research findings around the ways in which students use the online space. Now I know there's a lot of information here, so I'm sorry, this is quite a busy slide. What, what I'm sharing with you here are the students' voices. These are um, what students um, shared with me in terms of their experience of the online space that they were in. So these were students that formed part of my BA Childhood Practice degree program. Um, and they were also my research participants as part of my doctoral research. Uh, and I was very interested in trying to explore whether the online space had the um, ability to foster uh, transformative learning for the students that I was working with. And so I was interested in hearing them share with me their experiences of the spaces that I had created for them online. Now, what I've not done is really given away what my positionality is, but I would assume from the title of the presentation that I'm giving that you would know that I fall wholeheartedly on the emancipatory, transformative, and that my vision is that education is an art form. And my role is to interact with my learners as fellow human beings with the respect, compassion, care, and love that goes along with that. So the spaces that I'm creating online are warm and friendly and trusting. And I hope that what you can see here is these are the students reflecting back to me what I would hope the spaces allow them to experience. They felt that the online space was a level playing field for them, that it broke down any barriers related to what Bordeaux refers to as social and cultural capital, and that they were able to um, feel as if they were on the same level as me in terms of who they were as individuals, because the power dynamics were altered. I was no longer the sage on the stage. I was the guide on the side, helping them to become who they wanted to be. They also felt that the online space was a safe space for them and that it enabled them to be playful and that in some ways it, it encouraged pure relationships. Now, these are students who predominantly at this time weren't seeing their fellow students. We're now moving into a realm of online learning and teaching where there is a lot of synchronous delivery and therefore there is that more visual representation of your learners and yourself as the educationalist. So this doctoral research that I did was a number of years, well not, not I'm trying to figure it, six years ago, and there wasn't as much synchronous delivery happening at this time. It was predominantly online, fully online, through the written word. And while there were a lot of collaborate sessions, the collaborate sessions were more written than actually you seeing the tutor. So we've advanced a little bit further <clears throat> from that. And that these learners shared with me that the online space allowed them to play with their identity and become somebody that they never thought they had the potential to be. And it really showed ways in which the online space had the capacity to transform their lives, 
to be more than they were when they, they started the journey with us. This fish and water is a, is a concept that was coined by Bordeaux. So this idea that the online space allows the learners that I was working with, which were predominantly non-traditional learners, to become fish and water as a result of the online space and what that enabled them to experience from that space. What I'd like to share with you here is I'm now turning my attention to the educationalists. So we've looked at our positionality, we've started to look a little bit at this idea of this iceberg effect. I've shared a little bit there with you in terms of the students' experiences in the online space. And now um, what I'm sharing with you here is a more recent piece of research that I did because having looked at the students' view of the space, I wanted to be able to gather my fellow colleagues perspectives of the space and how were they using the online space and where did they position themselves in this space what i didn't speak about when i shared with you the science and art um, positionality slide is i didn't say a little bit about what i discovered in relation to the colleagues that i work with um, what i would define as a, a way of being or a need to be what came out when I researched my colleagues is that when you started to unpick the answers to the questions that they were giving to me, it came across in their words. Now remember, this was a co-construction of analysis process that I was going through. So I'm I was applying my own interpretation through their words. <clears throat> but what came across is that for some colleagues working online, they lived and breathed this way of being, this emancipatory model, this real idea that they were driven to create a space online which enabled their learners to transform. When I say this idea of way of being, it was like they were just born. It was innate. It was like they lived and breathed it. Now, I compared that to some of the words and the responses, and I referred to this as a need to be. What came out? from the research that I was doing with my colleagues is that it seemed that some of my colleagues would say the right things, but I didn't know whether it was really innate in their way of being or if they had learned it as a result of training, their lives, their experiences. And that became, uh, I then became to question this idea of authenticity and uh, can we ever, and you may disagree with me here because I have lots of heated conversations about this. Can we ever be authentic if we adhere to a need to be rather than a way of being? There's something for people to consider there. That's quite a heavy <laughs> pondering there. So here, what I'm sharing with you here is this is what the, um, my colleagues were referring to in these words and these concepts here as the nature of authentic practice. This idea that you are effectively connected to your learners and that you are there with them. This idea of I see you, you're going to think this is a bit crazy. Avatar, if you've seen the film Avatar, the Navi, which is the indigenous population in Avatar, have a way of greeting each other. And if you've not seen the film, this isn't going to make much sense. But they go, I see you. I see you is a way of saying, I don't just see who you are that is determined by your physical appearance or how you dress or your gender. It's I see you as a human being, as a fellow person. So what I'm really interested at is how do we do that online? How do we connect with our learners when we are unable to visually sometimes see them, although we are now moving in a direction where that is possible. I don't wanna to spend too much on this because I, I am really aware of my time and I am going to bring you into one of my modules to actually show you a little bit of an insight into how I go about constructing my online space. And I think I want to make sure there's time for that. 
this is just something that's uh, become more, more and more apparent as we're moving into the online space. It's the health and well-being, not only of us as online educators, but of our learners who are, I sometimes refer to it, intravenously connected to each other. So I have two phones at the moment. One is my personal phone and one is my work phone. Wherever I go, I have these phones with me at all times. They bing, they go off, and what am I driven to do? Look at them. And what else am I driven to do? Respond. It can be a Saturday, and if I happen to be passing and it buzzes, or it's connected to my watch, what am I driven to do? Look. And then what am I driven to do? Respond. And therefore, there's a whole blurring of our boundaries in relation to the online learning and teaching because we never, <laughs> we never shut off. So our personal and professional boundaries are really blurred. So the one thing that I would say in terms of my own experiences, and listen, I am not very good at managing those blurrings in any way whatsoever because of my positionality. I absolutely want to be there for my learners. And therefore, when they communicate with me, whether that's a text, an email, what am I driven to do? Respond. Because in my world of online learning and teaching, they're speaking to me. They're speaking to me. And suddenly, email, which is an asynchronous form of communication, becomes synchronous. Because I'm absolutely driven to want to respond to them. So this is something that we really do need to be mindful as we move forward in this world of online learning and teaching, that if you are positioning yourself in relation to an emancipatory model of education, and what that means to you as an educationalist, you need to be really careful of your boundaries, time, and expectations, and that the emails don't suddenly become the demons that we cannot escape. The final slide that I want to share with you here before I dip into my module is this concept of uh, becoming, and it, I really do feel it is becoming more human. We, we, we never are fully human. We're always becoming. It's not a being. It's a becoming process. And that if this is what we expect of our learners, we have to expect of, of ourselves as educationalists. And be very open and vulnerable to what that means in terms of our role as an educationalist. We would never, as an educationalist, put ourselves on a pedestal and view ourselves in a way which is superior to our learners in a world of becoming more human. We are on the same level as the learners. While we have, may have more knowledge and understanding than they have, that does not put us in a superior position to them. And this idea of love-led practice, what I've not shared with you is that my initial stepping toe into educational, uh, the educational world 30, over 30 years ago was as an early years practitioner. I worked with children under five years old. Now, that may in itself give you some understanding to why I come to the world of adult education in the way that I do, because my background is steeped in the pedagogical approaches around early learning and childcare, and how important love, care, compassion, and social and emotional dimensions of learning are, because I've been influenced by the pedagogical and the theoretical philosophical concepts around early learning and childcare. Love like practice is something that's used within early learning and childcare. I think it's a bit gimmicky. I'm not too keen on it. But actually, I think it's just good practice. We speak about innovation, we speak about creativity. Innovation to me means everything and nothing. You know, I spoke to Kenji about that. You know, what, what is innovative? What I do is not innovative. What I do is just good practice. So sometimes I find it really challenging when I am put on the spot whereby, no, Alice, what you are doing is innovative. You need to get out there. You need to shout about this. And we're, no, I don't, because this is what everybody should be doing. So this idea of love-led practice is what 
again, I'm trying to um, apply to the online space. This idea of shifting the discourse away from the technology. Yes, I do need to have some understanding of the technology, but I don't need to have um, every single specialist understanding of every single tool to be able to create a space in which fruitful learning and teaching is going to um, happen. So I'm just aware of time, Kenji. Uh, is it still okay for me to uh, go into the module? Do we still have time for me just to show? I'm, I'm, going, to, oh, I'm going to say five minutes. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm going to um, take you into one of my module spaces here. So I have to be really mindful of GTPR here. So I can't take you into any of the places where uh, my learners have been interacting. So what I'm sharing with you here is the screen of my master's level module um, called Theory and Practice of E-Learning. So this is really um, about the theor theoretical and pedagogical concepts and frameworks around e-learning. What you'll see here is that you'll see the images um, for the different tiles. We use uh, Brightspace within our, as our virtual learning platform, and, and we have certain images for the different areas that the students go in. You'll see here that I do a welcoming video um, prior to UHI having its own uh, streaming, I had my own YouTube channel and I recorded videos regularly and used them within the modules. Uh, videos are an amazing way to connect with your learners. Yes, they are asynchronous because they're one direction, but you can use them as a way of going into the discussion boards. You can be videoing yourself while you're in the discussion board. You can be speaking to your students about what they've put in the discussion boards. And then you share the video with your learners. And I can guarantee that when they view it, they feel like they're there with you. And I know they're speaking to me because they tell me they're speaking to me when they, um, they then engage with me, perhaps in a synchronous situation or um, on the discussion board. The other thing that's really important um, is I use my announcements regularly within the, the space. And I'll just share you share some of those with you. You will see when we go in how, how much I do speak to my students. So this module's finished. Look how many announcements are going on in my module. Um, I would always start with a welcoming announcement. The welcoming video would be available to the students at that time. I also start with a quite fun induction activity. You know, when you're thinking of inducting into the online space, it's really important that you set something up that's quite um, fun for them to get involved with. So I have a shooting stars competition in all of my modules. So the first couple of weeks, what they have to do is they have to find the shooting stars. They send me where they are and they win a box of chocolates. Um, uh, uh, their names go into the hat and they win a box of chocolates. What I also do as part of my announcements is I'll do videos. So each week I might do what's referred to as a touching base video. And again, it's me speaking to them and telling them what's going to happen in the module this week. At the end of each week, I might also do what's referred to as a roundup video. So this is an idea of what I'm saying to you. So there's knowledge that I'm transmitting in this module, but what I'm doing is I'm wrapping around that more transmitting of knowledge with interaction and humanness and showing the students my sense of vulnerability and who I am so they then can connect with me. You can do quirky things like have funny things in the background as you're doing your videos. One of my colleagues has a different pair of shoes every time she does a video and the students then will have to try to guess what kind of shoes that you're wearing. This is just little things that you can do. You can record a video while you're out walking your dogs. This week, we're going to do such and such. I'm out for a walk. I was at a conference in New York a couple of years ago and I did a video of me walking around Central Park, chatting away to them. Here I am, I'm in New York and I'm still connecting with you um, and look where I am and look what I'm sharing with you. So this idea of not 
you need to think about giving a bit away of who you are as an individual and that then allows your learners to connect more with you. So the online space is not cold. The online space is not a stark environment because you can fill it with lots of humanity in relation to who you are and what you do within that space. Kenji, I don't know whether that kind of comes to a natural end. <laughs> well, for un unfortunately, for, for those watching the recording, it does come to a natural end. Um, and I, I imagine that they are wishing that they were here with us so that we'd have an opportunity to discuss this further, because I'm sure there are tons of questions here from the audience that are with us today. But unfortunately, if you are watching this online, um, this is the end, but please do join us for any other future Virtual Bridge sessions. They tend to run from Tuesday to Friday, um, unless there's something else is happening that day. Uh, <laughs> but generally, you can join us 11 a.m. Uh, Tuesday, Friday. I hope to see you there. Thank you very much for joining us and stay safe. Thank you.